Hi, I'm Nicholas Brown. I'm head of the School of History at the ANU, and this week is the Alan Martin Week, and we're really privileged to have Professor Joy DeMussi from the School of History and Philosophical Studies at the University of Melbourne as the Alan Martin Lecturer. Joy, welcome to the ANU. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you're a graduate of the ANU, so I imagine it's kind of familiar territory, but you've covered a lot of space since then. I suppose the first question I wanted to ask you is, you've covered a really huge range of, of topics in your, in your historical research. Feminism, socialism, cultural history, football, um, sound, and, sound and elocution, uh, and most recently immigration and transnationalism. It's a huge field. Is there one kind of question or one kind of core issue that, that motivates you throughout that work? Thank you, Nick. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, a that's, that's a big question, uh, and it's an interesting and a challenging one, I think, for any historian, because uh, we do often work across different topics and, and, and fields and areas. Um, I think if I had to identify one theme, it would be around moments of change mm -hmm. and how people have responded to those, be that to theories of the self through Freud and the coming of Freud and Freudian ideas, or the uh, conscription campaigns of the First World War and how people responded to that. So I'm interested in moments of change that transform people's lives mm -hmm. uh, and how they react to those. Obviously around um, a gendered response as well, how men and women differently or in a similar way yeah. uh, respond to um, historical change. But I think that would encompass probably most of the topics I've been interested in and um, you know led down to research. Uh, in because um, I think once you once you look at those hot spots or yeah. points of tension mm -hmm. in history, I think how people react to them, governments, ordinary what we call ordinary people, I think it can open up a whole new perspective on that event. But what's really striking about your work, and it's becoming richer in a way as you go as you go along. I suppose it's most evident recently in your work on Greek migration is that focus on the interior life, on trauma, mm -hmm. memory, and so. On. Where does where has that come from for you? Right. Okay. So that has been obviously a big theme yes. in uh, a lot of my work, mm -hmm. um, and that too is a response to uh, violence, I suppose, and violent mm -hmm. events of typically the first and the second world war in my yes. work. Mm -hmm. So I think um, to look at trauma and uh, its historical expression has come out of my interest in particularly those two world wars and of course the Greek Civil War. Mm -hmm. And where that has come from, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, is probably um, an autobi I answer that autobiographically mm -hmm. by probably reflecting on the fact that my parents were post-war migrants here mm -hmm. after the Second World War from Greece and the stories I grew up with which were very much around the experience of my, my family, immediate and extended, during the Second World War and the Greek Civil War. And I think that's inspired a sort of interest in how people grapple with memory of war. Mm. And, you know, whether consciously or unconsciously, I think that has informed so much of my research. Yeah, crisis, conflict, crisis, violence conflict. is so yeah. much, the, the memory, the inheritance of violence is mm. so much a part of what kind of drives your inquiry, it seems. But also sitting there really centrally to your work is political commitment. I mean, it's been central to your work really going back to your graduate studies, women and socialism. Do you see a particular role for historical perspectives in dealing with questions of politics and political commitment? Oh, I think so, Nick. I think that's very much a part of um, what I've been exploring since mm -hmm. I was here as a PhD student, and even before that as an honours student and a vacation scholar here, <laughs> um, when I looked at socialists during World War I. Mm -hmm. I think looking at the past and the way in which political mobilisations have um, emerged to challenge and critique existing orthodoxies um, and wisdom, I think is really important to understanding how we get to where we are today mm. around a, you know, a whole host of issues. I mean, my particular interest, of course, has been around um, women's issues, women's rights, mm. women's yes. uh, position in society, to put it in those terms, um, and throughout particularly the 20th century, um, exploring how that's emerged and the issues that we face today. So mm. it certainly, I think, dove dovetails into the contemporary world. That's driven your research, but I know, I mean, you're a really passionate teacher as well. I mean, how does that inflect into your teaching, that, that political commitment? Yeah, I think that's really important. Mm. I think in terms of just trying to get students to reflect on uh, and be critical of accepted orthodoxies and accepted mm. views of the world, I think are very, very much a part of what we do as teachers to challenge them constantly about, you know, where they're coming from and, and 
to open them, themselves up to alternative views or other views that, mm. that might not be available to them. We've just been talking about the difference between our generations and a younger generation. And do you see, it's as, it's, when you're talking now to a group of 18, 20 year old students, what do you think politics is for them? Is it any different to what politics was when it was really shaping your own interests? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think so, Nick. I mm. think I think when I was going through as an undergraduate in the you know eight, early eighties, mm. um, politics was far more, if I can use the word, ideological. Yes. I yeah. think ideology yeah. has gone. Mm -hmm. um, now we can argue whether that's a good or a bad thing, mm -hmm. but I think young people are less ideological these days. There's less of an ism that they're attached to. Yes. Uh, and again, that's I'm not putting a judgment on that. I think that's an observation about change. Yes. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, and of course, the other really radical departure from our generation is the digital age yes. and what that means for politics. Yes. And that means a lot about uh, exposure to ideas, exposure to how they see the world at a scale and level we could only imagine when we were going through. And how they see themselves in the world, I think. It's that self-actualising, mm. I can be whoever I like because I've got kind of a Facebook page. Exactly. And that, that changes politics, I think, quite I think fundamentally. quite significantly, that's right. And then the way that connects, I suppose, to the other big theme, I suppose, that comes through your work, and that is the engagement with gender, and most recently your mm. real commitment to exploring women in leadership. Um, and in, in an Australian context, how as, historian, as a historian do you see the current state of play in terms of women's leadership in Australia? Well, I think it depends on where you look, but mm -hmm. if we take a broad um, helicopter view, as they say, um, it's looking pretty grim, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I think almost we could say things have gone backwards. Mm -hmm. um, when in, say, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, there was probably more of a sustained effort, particularly in um, institutions like the universities and so on, to really try and target women and promote them. Mm -hmm. And certainly there are efforts afoot and they continue, but um, I don't know how much we've advanced, actually, and the, the, the debate around targets and quotas mm. encapsulates that. Mm. I think there's a degree of frustration for people like myself who've been in the system for quite a while, mm. trying to push forward women's um, equal representation and so on, mm. and constantly not achieving those. So the argument, I think, for quotas um, is starting to emerge out of that space, yeah. and I think there's a real um, case to be made for that to be honest, um, yes. because I think we've tried uh, other, other forms other ways, yes. and we're still here mm. looking at poor representation in, in the political sphere, on boards, even at the level of um, GO8 vice-chancellors. There are more women, of course, as mm. vice-chancellors, but you find that still it is the case that in the more senior of those roles, they are taken up by men. So I think we're at a time now in the sort of early 21st century when mm. we really have to um, reflect on how we're going to go forward. And so the next decade is not like the past decade where mm. I think we have gone backwards. This is kind of off script a bit, but it really, just that last point touches on a really gripping aspect of your most recent book on Greek migration, which is dealing with the question of motherhood and different ways in which you might understand the role of mothering, both for children that are your biological children, but given the, 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 de the depth of which you explore the removal of Greek mm. children from their parents, it's a very fine-grained analysis you give of responsible motherhood in that in that in that in that discussion. How does that motherhood, the role of women, the changing world in which we're mm. living in, how does that fit into perhaps where you might see your work as a historian contributing to thinking about issues of gender in the future? Well, I think I mean I think I'd have to say from the outset that mm. even writing about mothers has mm. been a big shift in historical yes. research. I mean, mm. now it's much more acceptable, mm. obviously. Um, but I think um, politicising motherhood is a role that I think historians can play mm. in identifying the challenges and issues that mothers have had in the past in cat cataclysmic events like war, yes. which are so often the preserve of historians looking at the battlefield or other aspects of war in more conventional terms and spotlighting motherhood as an area where women obviously um, are central and the decisions they've had to make in terms of war. So rewriting and politicising motherhood but then rewriting our understanding of past events is the role historians can make I think in that and then moving forward um, appreciating that you know these events are more complex than 
uh, simply taking one view, which is often, often um, a view of the role of men mm. in shaping those events. It's a really challenging, beautifully written part of your most recent book, and I encourage any you know, historians out there who are thinking about a new way of approaching what might seem to be fairly settled issues to look at that aspect of Joy's book, because it really it grips your attention, it raises such complex ethical, moral questions, and it changes the way in which you see kind of the trauma and memory of war. So thank you in particular for that. Oh, thank you, Nick. That's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess it's bringing together the themes we identified earlier, like my interest in memory and trauma, um, feminism, uh, in, in a new way, joining up those dots so that we can now look at history from a completely different perspective than we did beforehand and moving forward and building on those insights. Thank you, Joy. Oh. Joy will be giving the Alan Martin Lecture this evening in Canberra. The book, the, the, the lecture is published as a booklet. Please, if you're interested in gathering a hold of the lecture, and you should be, uh, contact the School of History. Joy, again, thank you very much for your commitment to this big week of working with us, working with early career researchers and graduate students here at the ANU. It's great to have you back. Great. <laughs> great to be back. Thank you very <laughs> thank much. You. Thank you. Good.